everybody, welcome along to Percussion Discussion, episode 96. Uh, as usual, I'm going to ask you to check out all our social media. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and of course, our world-famous YouTube channel, where you can find, uh, hear, and see all of our conversations. Um, if you wouldn't mind subscribing, it only takes a second, and this way it ensures that you don't miss any of the upcoming interviews that we have, and there are plenty of good ones in the pipeline, so I wouldn't want you to miss those. Um if you'd rather listen on the go, then this isn't a problem. All of our conversations are available in podcast form, and these are free to download from your favorite podcast provider. Please leave us a short review if you find the time. It really helps get the word out there and spread spread our conversations worldwide. So thank you for that. Um, today's guest, we're back in the Legends Lounge once more, and uh, definitely one of the most requested um, interviews. Uh, at least 15 or 16 people have asked for this one, so I'm glad to finally be able to deliver it. Um, this gentleman, uh, since 1962, all the way up to 1981, was the driving force behind the legendary status quo, played on all the big hits, played on some incredible albums, did some incredible tours, a guy with a wonderful, wonderful feel, and one of the best shuffles in the business. Um, then he went on to form um, John Coughlin's quo, he played with so many other people, and then of course the 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 incredible status quo reunion and documentary in 2012. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the wonderful John Coglan. John, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Oh, that's okay, mate. It was a pleasure when I, you know, Julie said uh, that this character wants to do a Zoom. <laughs> and I said, yeah, what's it for? And he talked, she said, well, you know, about drums and the past life and all that stuff. And I think, yeah, you know, why not? Cool. Well, it's always good to talk about drums, isn't it? And let's be honest, you yeah. know, you, you, you've played more drums than an awful lot of other people around. So uh, you're the man to talk to. So I guess, you know, uh, uh, we've been through some strange times in this last uh, in this last few years. and And you're kind of... Um, the, the John Coglan's quo is is kind of coming. Sad, I don't like saying it, but coming to an end. Well, for now, anyway, I guess is that is that correct? Well, what we're doing, we've um, we all, you know, but I'm I'm actually got another project I'm working on in October. Sure. Because every month in Burford, you know, it's not, that's in Oxfordshire, Burford. Yeah. And the Warwick called they have a jazz um, thing, and I I said to. Um, Paul Jeffries, who's a double bass player, I'd love to do some of that because ever since I started playing drums, which is donkish years ago, I, I always loved seeing bands, play, like jazz bands, right? Mm. With the, the brushes, get the brushes out and start doing some of that. I love it. And anyway, we, we're putting a project together, uh, which we're going to obviously rehearse and see if it works. Mm. And uh, Paul's come up with this idea jazz meets pop. So it's going to be sort of. What we see, what we did decided because I'm not a jazz person, they're not, he's not a rock person. So, what we thought we'd do, we do some, it's all instrumentals, by the way. So, it's going to be, it has to be stuff, tunes that people recognize. Yeah, of course. And just something obscure, you know. So, yeah, so that's jazz meets pop, and we're going to be doing some, uh, some of that and some gigs and around. This part of the UK, probably, I don't know if we bother going too far away, but we're all getting old, I am, you know. But uh, it's just, all it is, if you can imagine it, how many times have I played down, down, played, played rock and over the world, you know, since um, the day we released those those songs, you know. So it's a long time, and uh, I'm not complaining. I know we, I think all the fans are buying those records and being great fans. It's been super, but... Uh, you know, it's. Uh, I remember someone saying to me ages back, this woman said, oh it, oh, it must be so tiring doing all that stuff. You know, sort of locking it, you know, sort of, you know. And I said, if you wanted to go around the world like I have, you'd have to pay for it. Exactly. Whereas we, we went out in the world and got paid to do it. <laughs> it's wonderful, you know. It's true. It's right, isn't it? It's the tr it is the truth. Yeah. And, and 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 not not only you know as you say you, you're getting paid to do this, but you've got adoring fans. You've got the whole. You've got the whole. I mean, what more could you have wanted? You know, it's true, isn't it? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And uh, you know, we when 
we played sort of Canada, the States, then we went to, uh, we'd done um, Scandinavia, Finland, Norway, Sweden. Then we went down to, this is not in order, by the way, we went down to, uh, did Europe, of course, and um, then there was Australia, New Zealand, and Japan. Japan was really interesting. The fact was, the ones I can remember, uh, it was in theatres, so they're all sitting down, mm. which is unusual for a choir audience because they're like, uh, you know, if choir audience like to stand up, well, yeah. in the UK at least, you know, and uh, Australia probably. Anyway, we were playing, going through our set, and I remember every time we finished uh, a song, you know, da la la, bam, they go. Silence, big gap. And it was interesting. I thought, oh, maybe that's their way. You know, that's the Japanese way. But it was so good to go back out, back out there. We we did two big tours and we travelled everywhere on the bullet train. So, you know, that's a part of life that we we loved, and it was just really good fun. And thank you for the audience inviting us. You know, it was just something else. It's it's incredible. A, a, a hell of a life to lead, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. So just back to the jazz br briefly. Um, I mean, growing up, w w w I'm assuming jazz or big band drummers were, were formed part of your influences, I guess. Yeah, oh, yeah, because um, going back to my early days, we, we were brought up in, uh, we lived in Upper Norwood, which is near Crystal Palace, uh -huh. if you know that part of London. And uh, my mum and dad loved ballroom dancing. They used to take me along to the CPH, it was called the Crystal Palace Hotel. And they had big dance band songs. I used to go and they'd take me, they'd be ballroom dancing, as was the scene in those days. Mm. And I'd watch a drummer. And I thought, I'd love to do that, you know. Then I thought, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I said to Dad, I, I'd like a drum kit, Dad. And I remember Dad bought me a little drum kit. It's a little Broadway. Mm. Do you remember Broadway drums? They, I've, I've got one. <laughs> have you? <laughs> yeah. The one I had was blue, the little blue one. Yeah. And, you know, it was great. And it was just... Um, Bass drum, hanging tom, uh, snare drum, hi hat, uh, no, no floor tom. That came much later, but uh, you know it was great. And I, I remember someone said to my dad in the, this the pub we used to go and have a drinking. <laughs> I was probably underage in those days, but you know, hey, who cares? <laughs> and they said to Jack, my dad, uh, tell why don't you get John to come down and play in the Two Towers pub in in West Norwood, right? So I don't know how we got got the drums down there now but because my dad didn't have a car but anyway picture this there's this little back room in this pub with a woman pianist right now no rehearsal nothing like that you know uh just set the drums up in the corner next to the piano there's no pa system of course no she didn't have a microphone and i can't even remember what we played um uh, and it was so funny and you know I, I think we'd probably just play things like Knees Up Mother Brown, you know, stuff like that. What's a polka? I remember the, yeah, <laughs> I remember the old boy in the pub saying, John, it's that, what's that drum on the floor? I said, that's a, called a bass drum. Oh, it's too loud, too loud. And I was probably, I know, stepping on it, which I, always, I do. But, you know, I wish someone had, could have recorded it because I'd love to have heard how bad it sounded. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that the best education you could ever wish for? I mean, what... what so what age are we talking, 15 or 16 at this point, or younger? I probably think it could have been, yeah, 15, 16, maybe. Yeah, something around that, that time. It just it was just so lovely playing uh, a drum kit, a little drum kit, and uh, like, I suppose you call it showing off in front of people, really, I yeah. suppose. But uh, just it was so nice. To be, then they said, oh, come back next week, John, come back next week. So I probably did. We probably went to play, play it again. Yeah. And uh, then I think the biggest move was when I was at school, secondary school, uh, there was a, a guy in the class sat behind me, Stephen Ainsworth, and he said, look, John, you like aeroplanes, don't you? I said, I love aeroplanes, especially military. Anyway, he said, look, I'm in the air cadets. Don't tell the rest of the schools. We don't want uh, the class. We don't want all that lot up there. So we cycled up there the next weekend. I met the CO and I joined. And then a few weeks later, got my uniform. My dad, mum and dad, quite proud, you know. Mm. Son's going to go in the RAF, you know, who's going to join up. <laughs> anyway, so got the drum kit, of course, and, uh, of course, and 
in the squad room, there was Wally Rogers and Johnny Bostrom. We, what we did, we were both Shadows fans. We loved, you know, Hank Marvin, Tony Meehan, who was a drummer then. Of course, yeah. And Bruce Welch, yeah, and Jet Harris. And we'd, we'd, we'd sort of do shadow stuff. I mean, it wasn't even a, a talk of going to a, playing in a pub, you know, which we should have done, I suppose. But then two guys kept coming over and saying, can we listen? Can we come and watch, mate? Yeah, OK. And they were rehearsing with their band in the TA, the ter- Territorial Army uh, uh, garage, when they were rehearsing their stuff. And that turned out to be Francis Rossi and Anna Lancaster. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's, it's all um, adding up now. And, you, you, and they said, "Would you? Are you doing it with this group?" I said, "Of course not. No, we're not doing." It. They said, "Would I? Would I um, come and join their band?" So I said, "Yeah, okay, give it a try." And they said, "What have we got to lose?" You know? And this seems to be more promising than what what the little um, three piece was, but. Uh, it was great, and that that was the start of it all. And we, of course, we didn't know we were going to we didn't even have a name. I mean, Spectre is what is what came. I think came first. Yeah, status quo. The status quo came much much later. Oh, years later. But I think when looking back to all those days, I remember jazz musicians telling me they used to go up to London in um, Soho. I think it was a Saturday or something, and go take their instrument. <clears throat> they're looking for a gig. You know, that's how it was in those days. You know, there's big bands looking for such player, a drummer, a bass player, a clarinet player, a piano player. So I don't think they actually carried a piano up there, but they, they were looking for a gig. <laughs> Push, pushing it down, down Wardour Street, you know. Um, it'd be good. I'm sure it's been done. Oh, um, probably. Yeah, and, you know, and those days were great. And it, was, it paid off for me, you know. And um, then... In nineteen, I joined. That's I joined the band. That band in sixty two. Then we played. We had a manager called Pat Barlow. Got I think got us a, an audition for um, Butlin's Minehead mm. and playing in the Rock and Roll Ballroom, which we did. Unfortunately, because we got that, that's where we met Rick Parfit. Rick was on the same in the same place, but he was actually in the, what we called the posh gig. He was in the theatre playing with two girls. They were called the Highlights. Uh, you know, then we 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 said we got to get Rick in the band. He's got a great voice, and he, he eventually did turn up and play, and that's where how it all started. So purely by starting right at the bottom. In fact, that's how, how I think how all bands start in those days. Yeah, but just by somebody, and they say, "Oh, we're playing down the Duke's Head next week. Why don't you come down and play?" Or oh, we're playing, you know, science or science. Come and join the band, and I think. You know, those lovely stories about Charlie Watts, how he met the Stones, you know, and they said, well, no, come and join the band, because they were a blues band at the time. Lovely, lovely. And all, that's how it all started. None of us knew we were going to have lots of hit records. None of us knew that. It's kind it of, just a, it's like the childhood dream, isn't it, almost? It's, yeah. it's the way it's the way you see it in the films. You think, oh, yeah, this is, you put the band together, you make it, and, and uh, happy ever after. And, and it's great. <laughs> That it actually does happen that way. I, I remember um, a couple of years ago, I had the pleasure of uh, chatting to Kenny Jones, and it was the same yeah. for the faces and the small faces. You know, it was it, that's the way it was, and uh, it's it's lovely to hear. It doesn't happen like that anymore, I don't think. Not the same. Oh no, no, it doesn't. No, it's all uh, <clears throat> dare I say. I think a lot of things are like hype now. Dare I mention that word? But you know, it's not. I mean, me and Julie had a, a great little gig with BBC Radio Oxford for about four or five years, and it was a, in bank holidays they put our programme on. And what it was, because me and Julie get invited to what we call the old boys' lunch twice a year, and it's in Barnes. And it, it started, I think, with Keith Olsen, who was our publicist at the time years ago, and he had this idea of inviting members from certain bands that he got on with for lunch. You know, we all paid our lunch. He, he didn't buy he didn't buy hundred people's lunch, but <clears throat> and it was great. And Don Powell was always there, and Brian Bennett, Bruce Welsh. And of course, I say to Bruce and Brian, I did ask them, would you, would you be prepared to come on the program on BBC Radio Oxford? It's called Rockers Rolling. And he said, We'd love to John for you. Yeah, okay. So Brian came down one weekend, uh, then Bruce the following weekend, but Elkie Brooks. And we had uh, Linda's farm, all those people that we met at the lunch. And what we did, but there's no script at all. All we do 
me and Jilly, the last question was about, you know, because well, I mean, you wouldn't get a tour like this now, which was Status Quo Slade, Linda's Farm and Caravan on the same tour. No. All flying out with all our road crew to these places, into Australia, say, <clears throat> and going around, you know, playing all other places. But, uh, mate, you know, it was just it was just great. And none of us knew we were going to have hits, and but it was... All, all because we, every everything seems to fit in the right place at the right time. Big part of it, isn't it? And you know, and and, and if you think of the talent in that band, I mean, you, you mentioned Rick's voice. I mean, Francis has got a great voice. Alan, wow, <laughs> what, uh, what a voice he had! Yeah, you know, and 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 musically, all fabulous as well. I mean, it, it couldn't fail, could it? Really, you know. Um, I don't no. think so. Anyway, it was just. Was it evident from the start that it was it was really good? I mean, well, we did. A lot of people don't know this. When we were the Spectres, someone came up. I can't remember it was now. Said, "Look, why don't you do record a song called I Who Have Nothing?" Do you remember Shirley Bass's I know, song? I know the song. Yeah, I know it. Yeah. And we thought, well, hey, why? Anyway, if you can dig it out one day, dig it out of a listen. It's actually. It starts off with this big crescendo drums, you know, uh, on the floor, Tom, uh, and lots of keyboards and stuff and guitar, and then it goes one, two, three, and it becomes a rock song. And it's awesome. And I think we ought to dig it out and get JCQ to do it again because it, it was so, I recognise that, you know, what that's a Shirley Bassey song, you know. Not, and, uh, not what you'd imagine, it, it was, is it? No, and it wasn't. It wasn't a hit. I can't work out why, but it wasn't. So, you know, that was just one of the things that uh, we we did. Uh, we did quite a bit of recording as a specters. Then, of course, it all changed in '68 with pictures of Matchstick Men. Which Francis wrote that. He, he said he wrote that sitting in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't wish to know that bit, but you know, it worked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it certainly worked. I mean, did you going back a little bit? Did you? have any idea that this was going to become what it was going to come, how big it was going to be and it, it was going to be a living for you know, for the rest of your life did you did you have any idea that, at that point? I don't think so no, I, I think we were over the moon by doing lots of gigs, doing occasional tours and stuff, which I suppose we did do and, and meeting lots of great fans and, and telling us how good we were. And we go, yeah, keep telling me, it's great, you know, thank you. <laughs> and just really good fun and going to, then going, you know, into Holland, into Germany, Belgium, France, uh, then going to Scandinavia and just seeing all those places. And and, and just um, the only thing I, I felt in those days, it happens to lots of bands, I, I think if we'd had, say, two, two months off, say, mm. You know, and have a break, and because it, it it wore me down right up to eight. You know, like nine eighty one. I got <clears throat> got to the point where I had, I'd had enough and just wanted to move on, mm. and we fell out of it. And, which is bound to happen, is it? Because you need each other's pockets, as they say, every time. And if we weren't, I had a saying: if we weren't rehearsing, uh, sorry, if we weren't recording, we were touring. If we weren't touring, we were recording. Mm. And it just goes on and on and on. And I think if we'd had some time. I, Maybe there was a reason for it, but I I don't know. But uh, it's just one of those things. But we we did thank God we did the re reunion tour in good time. Yeah, you know, because if it looked any later, it'd been too late. Yeah. Well, I, I was going to mention that you, you know I was looking through your discography. I mean, I've got a lot of the albums, but there's few bits missing, and you know th there's a lot to own, isn't there? Let's be honest. Uh, and and from let me think, from '68 onwards, you were doing minimum of one album a year, up yeah. until the point where you left. You know, that's I mean, bands these days that that's on it's every two or three years maybe. I mean, um, I think it was. Oh, uh, did you put two out in '70? Was there two albums out in '70? I don't know, but I, I, I now you mention it, I I think you're probably right. Probably yeah. was. You know, it seems to be like a. A mill, we were like a one of those tre treadmill, sort of just going round and round. And I think there's only so much you could do. I remember we were recording in Holland in um, Lowstrex studio, and 
and there was this massive explosion, a big bang, and we thought, my God, something, something dreadful's happened outside. And so we stopped playing. All the electricity went off. <clears throat> so we ran outside the studio, and uh, what it was, it was a thunderstorm, mm. and it hit a tree. And the tree was probably about, about this wide. Not a big tree, okay, but it, it, there was a black line went straight down the middle, split the tree in half, and went under the ground and cut all the power out. I mean, it, it, that could have been worse, mate. You know, we, you, it, you could have thought something horrendous, you know. But uh, anyway, engineers came along, did what they have to do, and uh, we carried on recording. <laughs> Unreal. I mean, if you think, tw- say 12, for example, 12 albums in a decade. Yeah. I mean, and I don't know back then how long it would have taken to record the album because not only you've got to record it, you've got to write the bloody songs as well. And if you're on the road, how how on earth did you find time to do it to fit all that in? I, I, it blows my mind, John. It really does. Yeah. Well, also um, we used to spend time rehearsing the songs first before we went to the studio because we found you know that was the, the quickest way to get it done, really, other than wasting time rehearsing. But yeah. you know, and I think there's one. Um, Oh, what was it? Da, 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 da. Anyway, there was one one track uh, that Francis wrote. Uh, I can't remember what was it called. And he played drums uh, at home on it. And I, it was so good. I copied what he did and put it on, really? put it out on the scene. Yeah. Oh, again and again. I think it was right. I didn't know he played yeah. drums. Yeah, nor did I. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. So, I mean, in an average year, I'm, I'm guessing there was no such thing as time off. It was record, as you say, tour, record, write. Uh, and I can't imagine how tiring that must be. Uh, you know, I know people on the outside look in and go, that's just such an amazing life. But it's one part of life. It's not all of life, is it? That's the thing. No, no, we did get time off, of course. But um, I just think I would have liked a bit more. Oh, that song, by the way, is I'm propo- uh, what I'm proposing. Oh, is that right, it? Okay. What you're proposing? What you? You got it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, good days. But uh, you know, I, I had this before many times. People say, "What was your preference, John? Recording or, or playing live concerts?" I'd always say live concerts for me, especially for some reason it's a, a buzz about walking on stage and then playing to a great audience who who, who absolutely love what you're doing yeah. you know and I've had so many people recently say the, the gigs I've done with Jason Q they said uh, thank you for all the stuff you've done in the past and thank you for making uh, our lives very 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 happy and uh, I mean like I was told uh, on the reunion tour I think we did three or four nights in the Apollo uh, Hammersmith. Was mm. it Apollo? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. And uh, a family from Australia flew over to for four, four, four nights to see its gig, then flew back to Australia, and uh, I, I, I proposed probably to go back to work, I suppose. But anyway, then they flew back again with the whole family and went went to Dublin to catch the last show. So you think how much that costs airfares alone, hotels, uh, eating out, uh, all the expenses, you know, then flying to Dublin, booking another hotel, and you know, it must have cost a lot. But obviously, they must have enjoyed it as they wouldn't have done it, you know. So that that's really nice to know. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, that I mean that tour was. I, I believe that, that every ticket sold out in under twenty minutes. Yeah, I mean. That, that's just incredible, isn't it? It really is, you know. Yeah, there was a, also Rick Parfit said to me and Alan Lancaster, he said, uh, I really enjoyed doing this, guys. This is really great because it was going back in time, you know, the stuff that as we did as a four piece. Cool. And Ali said to Francis, I want to, why don't we carry on doing this, you know, which I would have been up for it, of course. And next thing is, um, Francis said, oh, no, I don't do that. Anyway, he was just didn't want to do it. So he, I believe he said to Rick, uh, look, why don't you go out of status quo PLC? Parfit Lancaster from Coughlin, right? 
So, blimey, that's strange. That means we have to get someone else and replace him. Mm. So I was a bit stunned and I said, well, you know, whatever it takes, you know, I don't mind, you know. Anyway, of course, then you know what happened to Rick after that. So it didn't ever happen. But, um, you know, it, it's quite amazing. So I wouldn't have been against it, but oh. status quo PLC, I mean, would it have worked? I don't know. I don't know. It's it's just I don't know it's a strange one, isn't it? But do you know the the, the documentary uh, Hello Quo? I, I remember watching it when it came out, and I, I was, and and I think there must have been so many people really looking forward to it, and and it didn't disappoint, did it? Was no. uh, you know you see the opening um, the opening scenes where you all meet up, you wander into the studio. Is that how it was? Because um, I think I think you went into uh, um, from oh excuse me if I got this wrong, but I think it was Roadhouse Blues was the first tune you did in the documentary, and it was just like it's back, it's here, you know. This is this is quo. Was oh it- yeah, that was yeah. That, I'll tell you, mate, that was um, Shepherd and Studios. Yeah. The only trouble is I found with that rehearsing in there for two weeks because it's a a, a sound studio for making films mm. and movies and TV and whatever. The, I took my love with kit, which I've still got to this day, which we, we was first seen on telly in, in 68 Man, Manchester, uh, Matchstick Men. Yep. And I took that kit along. But because the whole place is so soundproof, the drums sounded like they had a plastic pads on the on the drum and sound is so dead. Really? And it's all, you know, I, I don't I don't think the punters will realise that, but everything's really dry. You know, you know when you go into um like stone room, it's all stone floors, stone ceilings, sto- uh, sorry, not sorry, stone walls. It's for drums, wow, it's loud, it's wonderful. You can hear every note and beat and you know the sound's massive. But in a sound studio like Shepparton, it's all dead, yeah, and it's just horrible. But you know, we got, we got got through it. But uh, yeah, uh, and Francis said to me, "What do you want to do, Spud?" And I said, well, "I like to do um, April, Spring, Summer, Wednesdays because it's smashing tune. Mm. It's a, uh, it's away from the shuffle. It's like boom, 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 boom." Anyway, we're going through it, and Francis forgot a, a second verse or something, or the third verse or something, whatever it is. And I stopped playing. I said, no, you missed a bit. Have I? I didn't know that. Let me do it again. He was just burst out laughing. But, you know, it was good, and we we actually loved doing the tour, because the only thing that was different for Alan and me was using, for the first time, the in-ears, you know, the uh, yeah. in-ears, as we call them. Uh, so we had those moulded and, you know, someone comes around to house mould you and then they send you the, the copy. The, anyway, then touring on the tour buses, which we loved. Those buses are awesome. Yeah. Phoenix, yeah. I think they were called Phoenix. And, you know, there were four buses on that tour. Uh, it wasn't one each. It was um, me and Anna Lancaster, Jilly, Dale Lancaster, his wife, Bob Young, Sometimes Sue would come with it, uh, and now a few people, but that was that. And the other bus was um, Francis and Rick and uh, their crew, their people, and uh, the other two buses just for the road crew. But also, the nicest thing about it was we had in house catering that came with us on tour. And what was lovely about that, because we'd have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, normally at the gigs, but um, depending what time you got there, of course. But, uh, you know, they say, what do you want on the bus when you come off stage? And so that was always nice. And you'd pick something off the menu, get on your bus, open the fridge, and there'd be uh, like those little boxes with some hot food in it. You know, then, oh, dear, look what's in the fridge. Be some wine. Oh, that looks so lonely. <laughs> <laughs> We'd have to drink it. <laughs> oh. Uh, and you know, we got upstairs, upstairs, up. Me and Julie were at the front. Alan was at the back with his his, his wife in the back, in their big bed up there. And I tell him, man, it's the only way to go. Forget hotels because uh, having to wheel your suitcase in off the bus and having to check in, you know, the seat. And of course, <clears throat> what happens now? Because you know, fans can also stay in hotel also. So you know, quote fans have been fine. 
they try to very really polite and they leave you alone or just can have a photo, yeah, fine. But staying on the bus and just going through, I remember going up up the autobahn in Germany, they're going to Oberhouse next gig, I believe, and I was sitting upstairs with my glass of wine, feet up on, on the windowsill, because of massive big windows on those buses. And I'm going along, I said to myself, it's not a bad life, really. This is awesome. Drunk my wine, put it down, and just rolled off the chair onto my bed. It was wonderful to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I bet it was a, a, a little bit different back in the 70s, you know, in, in, oh. in, in the heyday. I bet travel was, you know, a bit a little less comfortable then, I'm sure. Yeah, because I think we had a, we had a tour manager called John Fanning. And he's, we had, I think we, we bought an American car or some, something. I can't remember what it was now. But we, he'd get tired. So I would drive or, or Rick would drive or Francis would or Al. We just shared the driving. It was all right, you know, but you know, oh, uh, yeah. And traveling about in vans, you know, and, um, but that's what it was. See, the thing is, in those days, you didn't know anything else. Mm. The only thing you knew is a limousine, but he said, who's going to pay for that? You know, <laughs> we weren't. So, <laughs> Even so, but the good thing about the bus, you can stretch your legs and go for walk, walk, have a good walk around it, you know, go and chat to the driver. And, and I remember sometimes we'd stop on the, on the motorways or the freeways or wherever we were, and they'd get more fuel. Then our door would open, and Rick Parfit would walk in with a banjo, you know, with some wine and stuff. I'd say, is Francis coming, Rick? No, miserable bastard has gone to bed. Oh, okay. So he never came on our bus, Francis. It was just Rick. And we we sit there singing these up by the brown and all that crap, you know. So it was really fun. Good days. And when the bus stops again, he got off our bus and got back on his. And I'm, I just think, you know, if you ever get a chance to do it one day, you should, because it is awesome. They're, they're so comfortable. And they're good fun. And he got, you know, you can put loads of stash in, in the fridge. You can put loads of food in the uh, uh, in the fridge, sorry, yeah. And, you know, it, it, it is good, mate. You, you should do it. And I'm sure there's loads of bands who um, agree with me because it is the way to do it now. Would you, on a tour like that, would you have stayed on the bus till it was time to go on the show? Or would you, it's obviously going to be more comfortable than backstage, isn't it? Or would you would you do the traditional backstage thing and have a dressing room there and then go on? Oh, yeah. We we go in, into, the, into the gig and take in the spirit of the gig. Yeah, and... Uh, yeah. See, most of those gigs were really good ones. So the backstage was, I mean, there's one I love playing uh, with my band is uh, the Stables in Wavendon, you know, Milton Keynes. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of the Stables? Yes, yes, I have. And they, there is a saying, it's built by musicians, for musicians. I mean, but the great thing about it, you back up the van or the truck or car, whatever you, you're in, <clears throat> you open the shutter, all your equipment comes out, as it comes out onto the floor there, there's a stage. There's none of this moving stuff upstairs, round corners and down corridors. You know, like it has been in the past for some place, some venues. But, yeah, and it, it, it's got a good green room. It's got great dressing rooms. The staff look after you. You get fed well. And nothing's too much trouble. And it, it's a gig for, you know, it, it's a musician's gig. It's a wonderful place. And uh, I just wish all of them were like that because there is still some some venues who go backstage and say, is this it? <laughs> Blimey, I can't swing a cat in here, you know. And uh, But that's why some are. But, uh, yeah, uh, if I had an opportunity to do a proper big tour like that again, which I did with that, the lads, I'd snap it up, and especially if it was a tour bus situation, which is the only way to do it, I think, you know. Just amazing. I mean, I just can't imagine. I really can't. But, you know, I'm glad you've you've uh, you've talked about it because it's it's something that maybe gets a little bit overlooked from time to time, you know, and uh, worth worth mentioning, definitely. Now, I I'd like to talk about um, about the stamina required from your point of view to do a quo show because when you were <laughs> – excuse me. When when you hear Quo on on record or whatever CD, uh, Quo live is a different thing altogether, isn't it? It's it's got a it it's it goes up another gear, and it's it's a party. It's full on from start to finish, isn't it? I mean, I've, I'm lucky to have seen Quo a few times, and yeah, different animal live. I mean, 
I was watching some footage of you a couple of weeks ago, and I think it was Gotta Go Home from 1970. And it's a bloody fast shuffle. Now, not <laughs> only is it a fast shuffle, it lasts nine minutes long. <laughs> and and both right hand and left hand, it's almost like the Texas shuffle thing at times. I, I don't know how you managed to do that. For, I mean, three minutes is tough. Nine minutes, well... Were you just I, in yeah. shape and on form, I suppose? I learnt um, to relax when I play, and uh, if that's possible. And because uh, actually a lot of people, I play right-handed, as you probably know, hmm. like, which I thought if, when I saw drummers in my early, early days, that's how they all played. I never really saw a left-handed drummer. Like, you know, Phil Collins was left-handed, hmm. uh, Ian Pace. I learnt, well, actually I'm left-handed, so when I write, I, I write left-handed. Didn't know that. Yeah, and also when I've had opportunity to be on a flight simulator, it's always a left seat. I tried it in the right seat because it, it, if the controls hit a bit stick about that big, it, you know, it, it, it seems right for me. Uh, I know what you mean about that song. That is fast, and uh, it's uh, I just relax. And what I try to do just make it's just the wrist that do the work. Mm. You know, that's the way I, I do it. And uh, honestly, it, it's the way to do it. And I look at that sometimes, and like, there's a few drummers I know say, how did you do that for so long? I don't know, I just did it. <laughs> but do you know, and I suppose if you're playing all the time, and, and let's be honest, um, at this point, m more there was becoming more shuffles, wasn't there? You know, um, not so much on the Matchstick Men album, but uh, and I think it was probably Mark Kelly's when when that kind of stuff start, it, it started to find its find its voice a little by then, didn't it? You know, quo. It was more that I, I'm guessing from from my point of view anyway. It was getting into that that R and B bluesy rock sort of thing at that point. Well, I remember Fran we were doing some gig somewhere in England, and I, Francis said, "Look at that drummer, John. Look at that drummer." And it, they were the support band. I can I can't remember who it was now, but the drummer. Their drummer was doing a slow shuffle, like but with the left hand doing doing the shuffle. Like that. He said, "Could you do that?" Drum? I said, "Yeah, I can do that." And so we put it in, and um, uh, in my chair is like that. Mm. In my chair, two hand shuffle like that, and uh, I learned all that off the early early days of seeing jazz drummers do it, and uh, I thought I can do that. And do you know what? It never dawned on me to even think about playing a left-handed kit because I'm left-handed. I was sat on left-handed kits. And as soon as I put my left foot on the bass drum barrel, it felt alien. You know, it didn't feel right at all. Mm -hmm. I thought, no, I've got to get off here quick. Uh, but as I said in the beginning, you know, I, I've been lucky enough to admire many, many drummers. and I've met them all. Mm. in my time, which has been lovely, even if it's only been a short 10 minutes chatting. But my greatest experience, Eddie Haynes, some premier drums at the time, yeah. uh, came to a gig and he said, oh, how's the kit, John? I said, lovely. I said, it's great, mate, as usual. You know, it's fine. And he said to me, um, you like Buddy Rich, don't you? I said, I do. Oh, I said, who doesn't? Oh, amazing. I just love to watch him play. And he said, would you like to meet him? I said, what did you say? He said, would you like to meet him? I said, oh, wow, yeah. And I thought, I don't know what I'm going to say, but the opportunity's there. He said, I'll fix it. He said, I know him extremely well. He'd be lovely. To, he'd probably love to meet you. I said, yeah, go for it. Anyway, what happened? We were on tour in England, of course. And um, the day came, and I think what we were, I think Quo was in Manchester, and I think Buddy Rich was in Preston Guildhall or something like that. The day came, we turned up, I got a roadie to take me, went down there, walked in, we tried the back door, because it was early afternoon, walked straight in, went upstairs, and I could hear someone tapping on the kit, and uh, we heard his roadie say, Buddy, your guest is here, because in those days my hair was really long. So I stood out like a sore thumb, you know, not like a jazz player, all the notes, short hair, no. <laughs> and uh, I got introduced to him, and I must say, honestly, Matt, he was, um, it was about two hours, and he was the loveliest guy I've ever met. He was so kind. Nice to hear. Because, yeah, I've, I, I've heard stories where, you know, he, he bollocks people and uh, sacks them and gets someone else in. 
and we get talking drums. And also, there was a, a journalist, girl journalist there, and a photographer. So they start taking pictures. And uh, she, said, well, she said, Mr. Rich, you're the uh, best drum in the world. What do you think of this guy? You know, rock drum, long hair and all that. <clears throat> Put me on her pedestal or a pedestal. was Okay, whatever it was, you know. Uh, he said, I remember this to the day. He said, um, well, there's no need for that, ma'am. He's doing his job. I'm doing mine. <laughs> Not the answer then, she wanted. <laughs> no. And I thought, well, this is awesome. And then he said, hey, John, have a play. And I, I said, what, well, you're is Yeah, man, sit down and have a play. <gasps> man. Have you ever had that feeling you want the floor to open and suck you up and take you away? <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God, no. And I sat on his kit. Uh, of course, he, you know, his, uh, his snare drum is slightly tilted, like, because he plays this way, you know. Uh, <laughs> I sat on it like the ride symbols a bit close for me. It was all a bit dim. Anyway, so he's standing in front of the hi hat, facing the audience, doing some exercises like this one. And I started to play some little rhythm. Uh, it wasn't a shuffle, by the way. It was something else, and it, it was really funny. He said, "Wow, man!" I said, "I don't, re- I didn't realize the sound is so good." <laughs> and also, he's just being nice. <laughs> Oh. Uh, and it was great. Then he said, well, Jeremy, better go and have a drink. Do you fancy a drink? And I said, yeah, because we had to get back to Manchester to do the show. He had to go on stage. And so he said, as you know, John, he said, I don't allow any of my musicians to drink alcohol before they play. So it was just coffee. So I went in the dressing room. And I got a fabulous photo of him and me in the dressing room like that. You know, um, what do they call that when you... You know, you. I, I know not, what you mean. I don't know what it's called, but yeah, yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't drinking each other's coffee, but it was close to that. And I tell you, man, I, I, I shot loads of people that um, they met him before, and he said he was arrogant. And I, and I said, well, I just think um, it depends on the situation. I, I just think, um, it, well, he was fine with me. He was lovely. I mean, he didn't have to be. He could he could have been as he wishes to be, but. Take it, you know, don't you? You know, yeah. And you know, I so said, "Do you like the UK, buddy?" So, oh, man, I love it. Yeah, he said the people are so nice, and it was just lovely. And do you know what? I think one reason I I got on with him so well. I think a lot of drummers actually go up to him and say, "Oh, buddy, could you explain how you play a paradiddle, little rudiment, or something else?" And I think probably it's got to the point where he probably said. Well, why don't you go and buy the book and read read how it's done? Why should I show you? You know, <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. I'll never know. But um, you know, I met all the drummers I've met. Uh, they've been lovely and great, and just so nice. And uh, a lot of people say to me, "I took up John. Uh, I played drums because of you, because of seeing Quo play in the seventies or sixties, whatever it was." And nice to know. You know, there's no and, nicer uh, compliment than that. I don't think. No. It's lovely. It's great. And also, I've got some great pictures of um, me sitting on his kit. Uh, and he's standing on my left side by the high hat with a massive smile on his face. And I remember Chris Welch is a journalist called Chris Welch. Yes. He, he met Buddy many times. And he said, John, I've seen that picture. I can't even remember the magazines. So, oh, he said, that's Buddy smiling. That's never been known. <laughs> now, so I sent him, I got Jelly to send him uh, uh, a picture, you know, of um, him smiling. And I look really forlorn. He's, like, he's standing here. He's bloody standing. Oh. <laughs> and I'm on, his, I'm on his drums. And do you know what? This is weird. He had an effect on me. We got back in the car, drove back to Manchester, and I told the guys, oh, man, it was awesome. And, and I... I I floated on stage that night and um, I, I just played so well in my mind that he did, he did uh, wonders for me and it was wonderful. When he died, I was pretty upset, yeah. you know. But uh, what a great experience to meet the, the best. And also, before I forget, I managed to get hold of Louis Belson's uh, kit once. It was for sale. Wow. And I knew the reason it was for sale, the reason... 
uh, it's a promoter, uh, oh, I can't remember his name in England, uh, put Louis Belson on tour, a Louis Belson tour in the UK. And I don't think ticket sales are very good. And Louis gave him the kit. Okay. Oh, Peter, Peter, somebody, Peter. Anyway, uh, and he said, would you want it, John? Would you buy it? And I bought it. I took it back to the Isle of Man. Uh, it was a, a double kit. I think it would, would it have been Slingerland? I can't remember now. Would have been, yeah. I kept, yeah, I kept, think I kept it for a few years. <sighs> and I sold it. I, I put it up in auction, which is, you know, um, in the Isle of Man, I had about four or five different drum kits. Um, Black Black Premier. But I still got my lovely Super Classic. Well, I was uh, going to talk about gear, actually. I was going to say, because... yeah. The Super Classic, obviously, is known by everybody, uh, you know, and it still looks in great shape because you've obviously had that a good while, haven't you? I had that since, um, I think it might have been 1963, 64, Did you and I still got new? it. Did you have that new? Oh, yeah. I, mean, I remember I went to my dad to Drum City in Shaftesbury Avenue, and my dad bought it for me and it was the best thing he ever bought me and I thought look at that that's great and it's, it's the same one that Ringo had at mm. the time you know the, the oyster bar I think they call it uh, same one Ringo used same sizes um, oh man they don't make drums like that anymore I'm afraid I, I got a, a lovely Yamaha green Yamaha that I've had for years and years I played with that I'm going to abuse that probably on the uh, the jazz meets pop I'll do Use that kit. Uh, the Ludwig, I was like I said, I've still got. But that's, we all have a box room in our house, don't we? It's full of boxes and never been unloaded because you, you didn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you think, oh, to get that out now, to take that downstairs and put it in the car or whoever's taking me to the gig. Yeah. Oh, no, I can get the Yamahas quicker. So you go through things like that. But uh, Natal have been good for me and, and, Russ Chad, who, who plays drums secondary to me, and we, we, we share the gig. But, yeah, it's lovely, mate. I, I think you're probably the same. I mean, do you have many drum kits? I've got five, uh, five I think, yeah. 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 Don't use are them, all, but I've got them. Are you um, Premier Yamaha? I am I love Premier stuff. I was going to ask you about Premier, because I know you've had a, a long affiliation with Premier over the years. You had the black yeah, uh, was it a twenty-six? You had a bloody big bass drum in the seventies, didn't you? I, th I think it was. If you look at my T-shirt, it's got um, drums on there. See that? Oh yes, fantastic! Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's got my name on the side somewhere. John yeah. Coughlin, some. Yeah. yeah see, <laughs> see, you know, you 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 and Premier go way back. Just talk a little bit about Premier because it's a company that I've I, I've had so. So, you know, I've had so many Premier kits over the years. I love the company, I do. Yeah, it, it, it's a shame they sort of ended up as they have, but uh, they were good for me, Eddie Haynes and the lads, and we went to the factory a couple of times and showed me around and saw stuff being made. And they were just drums that you sit behind, you think, this is nice, I like this. They're good snare drums, drums on bass drums. Yeah, lovely. And they were so good, and... Uh, you know, I wish I'd kept my Black Love uh, Premier, but, you know, life moves on. And also, we lived in the Isle of Man, Jilly, maybe 10 years, and I was supposed to go, go there for one to do the tax. And uh, we ended up staying because we liked it so much. And uh, then, <coughs> excuse me, then you moved back here. I moved back here to Oxfordshire, where I am now. And, you know, you can't, <coughs> there's only so much stuff you can bring back, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, that that's life. But uh, you know, I I just love drums. I used to go to Drum City a lot. I remember walking in there one Saturday afternoon. Was it morning? Saturday morning. And there were two drummers in there playing floor tom toms. It was Ginger Baker, and um, it was his. It was another um, jazz drummer who he who he looked up to and learned a lot from. I can't remember his name now. Uh, it's gone. Anyway, they were bat battling out in there, and then, no, it goes like this. No, it don't goes like that. You know, and I remember going up to the counter to buy some drumsticks. Anyway, so they're battling out behind me, and um, I wish I could remember the drummer's bloody name. Anyway, don't matter. Uh, he said, "Watch him, mate." He said, "Watch that salesman. He's selling some duff sticks." And this drummer said, "He said, what are you do, mate?" 
get a drumstick, lay it on the desk, and roll it so it rolls across the floor. That's the desk. Yeah. Right. He said, because if it's buckled, it'll go. It'll go like that, which is absolutely right. I mean, we've obviously yeah. seen stick like that, so you can't use them to throw them away. And I've never forgotten that. And do you know, it's amazing. I still do it to this day. But course, sticks are made much better now. Yeah. They don't. They don't do that. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah. But yeah, you know, good days and uh, just I just love jazz. I, I'm really looking forward to doing something different. You oh, know, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the thing is with drums, you know, it, it, it never that excitement for drums, whether it be playing at them or playing them or looking at them, it never goes, does it? You know, I no. I, I, I remember you had a, I think you had like a, a, a chrome kit as well, didn't you? Um, and then, and then there was the yellow um, the sound wave kit which you had, which I know Mike Ellis restored for you, didn't he? From Blend, yeah. Home. And and that was a lovely looking kit. I mean, I, I have a fascination with yellow drums. I don't know what it is, but do you still have that one? <laughs> no, I that went uh, that went to. Um, uh, I was with a band called Partners in Crime. We were releasing an album yeah. and stuff, and. Of course, <clears throat> that didn't happen, but for some reason, uh, I think it was promotion and PR wasn't as it should be. Uh, and someone won the kit, and um, I, I should have kept it. But I, I actually did use it on, I think it was a last, um, but it was a Butney's reunion type thing we did at Minehead, because that's where we started. And the guy that had the kit brought it along for me to play it, and it oh. was so nice. That kit. Yeah. And... Uh, it was nice to don't drive my car because it's got that, da -da 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 -da, you know, the, the four toms. And, yeah, it's got the extra two small yeah. toms up here, hasn't it? That's it, it. yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, uh, just, you know, we, we could talk drums for, forever, couldn't we? Really? I mean, yeah. it's the same with every drummer I speak to. I don't know if it's the same with other musicians, but drums is something a little bit different. I don't know if guitarists would sit and talk like this. I don't know, but uh, I don't care about them anyway. <laughs> but look, John, before we go, would you yeah. talk a little bit about Alan Lancaster? Because you know, lots has been lots has been said about Rick over the years, and you know, lots of people have, have, you know have said nice things about him. But obviously, Alan's been gone, uh, you know, uh, uh, since, uh, since uh, uh, you know a, a little a less amount of time, let's say. And ha from a drummer's point of view, what what was he like to play with? Alan on stage was great. He was. Uh... Because he had the gig of um, counting everybody in, counting all the songs in, and he was. I remember things going right back to even before the Spectres were formed. We were in his house. I was oh, from Peckham, South London, right? It was really funny. He say, "See that geezer over there? Yeah, what him? Yeah, looking. You know, he keeps clocking me. It's real Peckham man and doing it well, you know." I'll go and smack him one in a minute. <laughs> he said, he keeps screwing me, he keeps looking at me. I said, do you know what it is, Al? He said, what's that, Spud? He said, I said, it's those silly trousers you're wearing because we were all in different colours and baggy trousers and all that horrible crap in those days. No. <laughs> and when you see Only Fools and Horses, it reminds me of him, you know, the that <laughs> Peckham thing. <laughs> he, he was lovely. And he, uh, he was okay when he was okay, but he could, Alan was one of those lovely guys. He could, um, if someone put him out, he could throw his weight around, and you know, it was just that little bloke. But he, he was um, a lovely guy to work with. He's an extremely good bass player, by the way. Yeah. He'd ask me what you know, in particular, song what you're playing on the bass drum, John. I'd be playing, <clears throat> excuse me, playing fours. So he, he played fours on the bass. So we would work very close together, me and Alan. Yeah. Then Rick Parfit would do work his rhythm guitar with me and Al and um, a lot of people don't realise that Rick Parfit he, he explained to me once was um, you see a lot of these tribute bands doing um, doing a Rick Parfit, Parfit piece but they're doing what they thought Rick did playing the guitar but doing upstroke, downstroke, upstroke down, and Rick Parfit never did that it was all downstrokes so you know, yeah yeah that's a lot for your wrist, though. Yeah. You know, sure. sure. And, and that's what happened. That's how I believe the rhythm section of the band was so good because it, that's how it works. 
That's evident live though, because you couldn't get yeah. a grain of sand in between those those beats. It was just no, that's no. what creates that energy, isn't it? And and just you know, I, I mean, and, and whenever you see footage of Alan, he's always got a beaming smile on his face. Was it was that the way it was? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's probably a very nice young lady in the audience in the front that you like. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he was. He was all right. He was. Um, he was so funny, Al, and um, he, he was a laugh a minute, and uh, he was just a really, really nice guy, and I miss him dreadfully. And uh, sure. you know, then you think life is so unfair in some situations. You just, you just don't know because that example of life I've seen with people that. Oh, John, did you know so and so's uh, past? You know, no. And you, situations where, oh, how was he? You know, certain days. Oh, one thing he always wanted to do, and his with his wife was go, go to America or go to Hawaii or, mm. you know, um, for a nice holiday. And they kept saying they'll go one day. And up, like Jilly, my wife said, if you got to go. And you can fall to go, go, let's go. Because you don't know, none of us know, do we? No, no. Tomorrow could be the day you peg it. You know, we don't know, touch wood, but, you know, and I, I just think she's right. And I think if you can, we've done it many times. We've done, Jill and me, love gone on a cruise. We've done six or seven cruises in the uh, past. And awesome, great fun, great, you know, just, to, and people say, oh, I don't know I could do that. But, that's another story, but you know, um, I, I've had some good times on the road. I've you know worked with Rick and Francis and Alan. Uh, good days, even when Roy Lyons was in the band, Jess Savorsky before him. In good old days, and it's just, um, and it's nice playing with good musicians. I mean, I play with loads, Mickey Moody, ah, mm. oh, blimey, in, in in the Diesel Band, you know, Johnny Gustafson. Uh, uh, there's too many to, even for me to remember, but uh, it is good. I really, in this jazz thing, I'm hoping that we can play some blues as well mm. because I've always grown up with blues and it's great fun. And we did that in the Diesel Band. There's some good guitarists around who are very good at playing the blues, you know, and, uh, as you know. Uh, and it's just looking, I'm just looking forward to doing something different for a while. Oh, well, do you know, I'll look forward to. You know, if I can't be there in person, I'll, I'll look forward to seeing the footage or hearing the footage. You know, I'm sure it always materialises, doesn't it, with social media being the way it is? Oh, uh, yeah. You've had, you know, you've had a, an amazing career and you, you still continue to do so, obviously. And uh, it's been a, it's been a pleasure to share this. I don't know how long we've been talking, an hour almost. And wow. uh, honestly... I, I I can't tell you how much I appreciate it, John. Honestly, it's it's been oh, it's love, it's lovely, man. I love doing it, and also, you know, uh, just coming to my mind, John Bonham, the late great John Bonham. Do you know what I was with the Kinks? A quick story: I was with the Kinks because uh, I knew Ken Jones was there too, man. Yeah. Ken so invited me, and it was in <clears throat> in London. I think it was a studio, not a, a theatre, by the way, a little theatre somewhere. In, um, I don't know, I was going to say the Cenotaph, but I mean, it was, wasn't exactly there, but somewhere around that part of London. Mm. Uh, and the Kinks, the BBC used to hire it, and bands would go and um, record um, three or four of their hits, say, for the programme. It went out the week, following weekend, whatever it was. And there's this drummer playing with a guy called Tim Rose, a bass player, drummer, and Tim on piano. And me and me and the lads were sitting there thinking, this guy's awesome. This is something else. And he came up to us and said, hello, guys, my name's John Bonham. Um, <clears throat> Tim's going back to America tomorrow. I don't have a gig. Can I give him my number if, if you give us a ring? Let us know if it's a band, need a drummer. Sure, you know what happened after that. And uh, suddenly Led Zeppelin was formed and we went to see them. Uh, and I think it was because uh, I got Colin Johnson, our manager, to put the pretty things on tour with, as a support band. Right, okay. Because I, I've always been a pretty things fan, even with the Prince before, then Skip Allen on drums. And uh, anyway, so they were pleased to do it. I said, Oh, it's great to see you, Phil, you know, Phil and Dick Taylor and Skip Allen and all that. And it was great for me to watch them every night. And they watched us. And then, as a thank you at the end, they, 
they um, just I think they were with um, same record company with, with Zeppelin, weren't they, or something like that? Because uh, they got us tickets to come and see Ze- Zeppelin playing in Olympia. Was it Swan Song? I think it was it. I think it could have been, couldn't it? I don't I'm know. Sure. I think it was Swan. Anyway, yeah. What what was what was awesome was sitting with the pretties in the audience and uh, sit down seating, of course. Uh, um, Francis was just over the moon with the way Bonham played, and I said, "Yeah, I'm with you, then, mate." I said, "He's great." And just to meet John before they were formed, you know. Then what we did, we all went backstage and just say thank you, great show, loved it. And they Zeppelin behind stage. It was a big, I don't know, big room, massive room. They had a band playing, so we were watching that band play as well after the gig. And I had a quick chat to John. It just blew me away, you know, wonderful. I've always been a Zeppelin fan ever since. And I love the way they recorded his drums as well, massive, you know, made that kit sound great. And I think it was, was it down on the ground floor of a staircase or something, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Great idea, you know. That's the way because that's the, that's the sound they wanted. And like when you see on TV, sometimes you see a camera going around with a particular drummer. <laughs> I got all that blue tack stuff on the on the tom toms. No, I've sat down on some kits. It's been on, then I've taken it all off. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> I want boom, I want a tom tom to ring. You know, I, want it, I don't want it to be dead. Here, here we are, a John. piece of carbon. Here we are. Oh yeah, that's ringing. Work it, a bit, work it a bit harder. I might, it might shut Zoom down, but I'll try. Maybe the Zoom thing doesn't like the. Hang on a second. One second. This this might help. Hang on. <laughs> try this. Yeah. One. Oh, better. Yeah. That's bad. It speaks to you. You know, that's wonderful, mate. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't like the blue tack stuff myself. So there you go. <laughs> it's um. Wonderful drums, you know they're, they're meant to resonate, aren't they? That's that's the that's, sure. That's the whole purpose of them. So, look, thanks so much, John. Honestly, this has been it's been a treat. It really has, and I I, I appreciate it so much. So, um, it's a so pleasure, mate. Talk again at some point in the future, maybe. Who knows? Yeah, you can always ring up, and um, we can talk again about something else, and maybe the jazz meets pop a bit later on that in the years. I think I think a lot of people would be interested to hear how that goes, and uh, you know, yeah, seeing a different side of you. That isn't it, really? Something that no one's probably ever seen before, really. I guess. And it would be nice to play, um, like the Warwick Hall in Burford is a nice little venue, and it's uh, it gets <clears throat> lots of people to see the jazz. I just want to go and play drums there. You know, that's all. It, it won't be Mike's up, of course, but it don't matter. But um, it'd be nice to get the brushes out and just do something different for a change. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Well, I hope it goes well for you, mate. I really do, and, I, and I'm sure it will. So, um, great. Well, uh, keep well and uh, enjoy life, and we'll see you soon. Yeah, it's been Thanks. a pleasure. Thank you. Hey, likewise. Thank you, John. Take care now. Cheers, man. Bye bye. There we go.